Hi folks, thank you all for joining today's webinar for RDS SQL Server. The topic for today's discussion is migration and cost optimization best practices. My name is Manish Punjabi and I am the head of RDS Commercial Go-To-Market and I'm joined for today's session by Sandeep Singh, who is a database solutions architect. For today's session, we'll cover a bunch of topics We'll start by discussing AWS's data modernization journey. Subsequently, we'll discuss why you should consider RDS SQL Server on AWS. We'll also discuss the various options with SQL Server on AWS. And then we'll go into the meat of the presentation with best practices. And finally, we'll try to wrap up with Q&A and some resources you could use to follow up upon following today's session. So over the last few years, the data we have in use today continues to explode. And this data explosion has led to us requiring a modern data strategy. According to IDC, in 2022 alone, we are gonna end up with 97 zettabytes of data. Now, on one hand, while we have significant data, 68% of organizations report that they are still unable to realize the value from the data. Based on studies, by making use of 10% more data, a typical Fortune 1000 company will see a 65 million increase in net income, which obviously translates significantly to the top line. Data-driven businesses on an average are growing by more than 30% annually. So that's another reason why you want to consider modernizing your data as you migrate to the cloud. AWS offers the broadest portfolio of purpose-built databases. On the left-hand side, you see AWS's RDS or Relational Database Service. RDS was one of the top three services introduced by AWS when AWS introduced cloud. Within RDS, we support six engines today. We support three open source engines, including Postgres, MySQL, and MariaDB. On the commercial engine side, we support Oracle and SQL Server. A few years ago, AWS also introduced Aurora. Aurora is our flagship database on the relational side, and the data in Aurora can be stored in both Postgres and MySQL compatible manners. Now, as the database market evolved, we recognized that the traditional relational databases were challenged by trying to scale the systems. So several other databases came to being based on the use case that a customer may be trying to address internally. We offer a key value type data structure with Amazon DynamoDB. Now, you may be dealing with unstructured data in the form of a document, and that's where we offer Amazon DocumentDB. And finally, you may be storing some stuff in a catalog which often has multiple attributes that require a wide column database, and we offer Amazon key spaces. Now, to realize the full value of your data, you need to consider modernizing the application and the underlying database. But the modernization journey on AWS isn't accomplished with one fell swoop and often requires multiple steps depending on the workload that you're considering migrating to the AWS cloud. On the left-hand side, you see the on-premises infrastructure that you may have today. While migrating to AWS, if you start the journey with a lift and shift, vis-a-vis -vis adopting a service such as EC2, which is our compute service, then you are able to get some benefit of migration, but you still have an reaped the complete benefit of migrating to the AWS cloud. 
and you can see that the cost of ownership goes down slightly with the lift and shift column, but you haven't necessarily accomplished a lot from your on-premises incumbent environment. Subsequently, if you adopt a managed service, such as RDS SQL Server, now you started to gain from reducing your total cost of ownership, and you've also increased your ability to innovate. The innovation velocity is important as you consider modernizing your workloads. Finally, at the other end of the spectrum is moving to one of our purpose-built databases that I just discussed, including modernizing to an open source database with RDS or Aurora. And that's when we see you achieve your maximum innovation velocity. So you want to think about this as a uh, mechanism or a trade-off in terms of what you can accomplish between your existing environment and the end state or where your workload needs to get migrated to. AWS has driven a lot of the innovation with services such as RDS based on customer feedback. Over 90% of the features we end up working on are driven by some customer requirement. The remaining 10% is where AWS often innovates on the customer's behalf, where sometimes the requirements may not be clear or we as AWS may see a certain pattern across customers and see the benefit of offering certain features or driving innovation. Based on our history with innovation with RDS, Gartner awarded AWS recently a solution score of 95 which is the highest ever rating in the Gartner Solution Scorecard for database platform as a service. Now, this was based on three areas, the first one being feature requirements, the other one being preferred criteria for customers, and 70% was based on optional criteria. Now, diving a little deeper into Amazon's RDS service, one of the reasons RDS has been as successful as it has because we've viewed it as a managed service with this breadth of database engines as discussed, and it has certain core areas of benefits that have resonated across the thousands of customers that have migrated. Firstly, it's easy to administer. In the traditional mechanism, most companies were self-managing the databases, which implied they were responsible for provisioning the infrastructure, installing the database, and maintaining the database software. But now, you would have offloaded that ability to administer by moving to RDS. In the process, you gain higher availability and durability, because RDS offers features like automatic, multi-AZ or multi-availability zone, so you can manage your database deployment across zones in AWS. We provide you database, uh, data replication, automated backups, snapshots, and failover. And so you end up with a higher level of resilience, which we'll talk about in a follow-up slide in terms of quantifying the benefit. Customers also benefit from a greater scalability. You can now scale the database and the underlying compute and storage with a few clicks. So you don't again have to design your database deployment for peak scale because you can scale it on demand based on the needs of your application and your traffic. And you can minimize the application downtime because your database is now in the cloud. And finally, you also benefit from a higher level of performance and security because we are, our database services are backed by SSE storage and guaranteed provisioned IO. So while selecting your database instance, you can specify if the base level of IO that's available with the service and the specific uh, instance size is sufficient, or you need to provision a certain number of IOPS based on the IO needs of your application. Additionally, you can also benefit from encryption both at rest and in transit. We worked with IDC a few years ago to quantify the business impact for RDS. 
So a lot of these numbers you see stated on this slide are actually based on a study performed by IDC. Firstly, what you see on the left-hand side is customers benefited by having the DBAs now with an ability to manage 60% more databases per DBA. So they benefited from higher productivity because there's an automation of mundane activities like backups, installation, provisioning that we just discussed on an earlier slide. And that resulted in a 40% increase in strategic initiatives because now the DBAs are freed up to focus on strategic initiatives for the customer. You can deploy 86% faster. So as a business, you are more agile. Customers on an average have increased developer productivity by over 42%, supporting a faster delivery and new applications. There's less unplanned downtime, again, because of the benefits of things like multi-AZ and replication that we discussed earlier. And IDC identified that the added benefit of 34% less database latency, 21% for faster queries leads to a faster, more optimal user experience. And finally, one of my favorite benefits is the economic benefit of saving $37,000 per database instance per year. Now, customers value this reduced cost and benefit from a 39% lower cost of database operations with a 264% ROI over three years. As we build out the business case, we often use some of these IDC study results in helping you develop the business case. Now, I mentioned I'll talk about the various SQL Server options with AWS. On the left-hand side, you see the on-premises environment where you may have certain database workloads today. In this, you are managing everything from hardware to the high availability, including scaling, patching, and backups of the database. And that's why you see that as being a customer managed and you essentially have host level access and full database permissions because you are controlling the deployment. Subsequently, when you move to EC2, you benefit from the hardware being managed now by AWS because with the EC2 service, you're effectively getting compute uh, from AWS, but you are still responsible for the scaling, patching, backups, and HA of the database. Now, before I talk about RDS Custom, I want to talk about RDS. We've always viewed RDS as effectively a fully managed service where AWS is responsible for the hardware, scaling, back, backups, patching, and the HA of the database. And we still encourage you to consider RDS SQL Server for your workloads, and we'll get more into the best practices here shortly. But RDS is still our flagship service for SQL Server. Last fall at reInvent, we introduced RDS Custom. And with RDS Custom, while AWS manages the scaling and hardware, now patching, backups, and HA of the database are a shared responsibility with the customer. Because RDS Custom allows you access to the database and the underlying operating system. So now you have full control of the instance, and this is especially useful while deploying third-party applications. So the three primary use cases you want to consider RDS Custom for include granular control, if you need to install custom drivers, enable features or application that require elevated privileges. I mentioned CLR, you may have extended stored procedures, or you may need to use the resource governor feature or link server, as I mentioned. Alternatively, you may want to lift and shift business applications that have never been able to take advantage of RDS SQL Server, such as Microsoft SharePoint and Microsoft Dynamics. So any third-party packaged application can now be moved with a service like RDS Custom with minimal changes. Finally, you may have a custom setup for DR. You may still be using SQL Server always on availability groups 
or SQL Server's native replication capability. But this custom DR setup based on your requirement now allows you to use RDS custom. Again, because you've got access to the operating system and the database system. So I encourage you to consider RDS custom for SQL Server. It's also available for, for Oracle as an engine, and that's branded as RDS custom for Oracle. Now let's talk about our migration framework that we've developed and refined over the numerous migrations that we've performed over the years. So when our team, the AWS account team gets involved with the migration, the first thing we try to do is go through a discovery phase where we try to understand your requirements. We validate that RDS SQL Server is feasible vis-a-vis -vis features your application is using today that are in fact supported in RDS SQL. And then we sometimes consider a hybrid approach between RDS and EC2 if we encounter a feature that may not be available with RDS, either SQL or RDS custom for SQL. Subsequently, we go through an assessment phase, your current footprint, your Microsoft licensing terms, and then we try to uh, uh, deploy a automated tool, which I'll talk about shortly, to assess your environment. Subsequently, we go through an optimization where we'll right size and consolidate your environment, and then we'll map your workload to RDS instances based on your sizing. And we offer numerous programs that can help educate you during the process. And the goal of this exercise is to develop a business case so you can see what the cost would be on RDS based on the model that would have been created and what credits and financial incentives that you qualify for. So this is a higher level picture of the process that we follow. When we start on the left-hand side, we try to understand all your cost elements in terms of your infrastructure costs for your data center, your costs of availability and risk mitigation, costs of your IT staff, and underlying OS and virtual machine, and what you may be paying Microsoft annually for software assurance, and then what SQL Server licenses you have already paid for that are still existing licenses versus licenses that may have expired over time. Subsequently, you reap some benefit as you move to EC2. You can see the column is shorter because now your costs have gone down slightly because of adopting EC2. So you've replaced the lower data center costs with EC2 infrastructure costs. Subsequently, we map your workload to RDS SQL Server. We try to get a sense for what does the full picture on RDS SQL Server look like. Now, RDS SQL Server, by definition, is a license included model. So when you get the RDS SQL Server instance or service, you are also buying the underlying licenses. Now, it's possible that you may be somewhere in your licensing process. And so we do have credit and incentive programs to offset some of your license costs. Our account team can discuss with you when we are going through this migration process. While moving to RDS, we'll also consider some right sizing and optimizations. So that way you can deploy this on AWS in a optimal manner. And Sandeep will cover some of those in the second half of this presentation. Finally, when we develop the entire business case, as I mentioned, we will factor in all the discounts and credits you are eligible for. If you are an already an existing customer at AWS, you may already be eligible for certain discounts based on your existing level of spend. Subsequently, we offer numerous incentive programs to accelerate your workload and also to make it uh, economically feasible for you and your budget. Now, during the assessment phase, we have a certain program called the OLA, which stands for Optimization and License Assessment. We encourage workloads to go through this process, especially if you have a large number of SQL Server instances, because this assessment process is a very systematic approach to helping you understand your workload and subsequently mapping the workload to RDS. And through this process, we start by trying to 
establish a baseline. What do you have deployed and how much is being fully utilized? We try to understand your existing SQL Server instances with CPU utilization because that CPU utilization is the basis for right sizing and consolidation. Subsequently, we try to understand your existing costs. As I mentioned, we try to understand your Microsoft license picture. You may have a Microsoft license statement. So we try to obtain that inventory of your existing Microsoft licenses so that we, we can map it to AWS in an optimal manner. Subsequently, our account team will work with you to build a plan. We'll collect all the data we need including the utilization that I mentioned, and we'll essentially create a TCO model for you. Customers often see significant reductions while moving to AWS. Now, the significant area of reducing costs is by ultimately modernizing and getting off your SQL Server and Oracle licenses over to open source. So we'll kind of build out a plan for you as well as you migrate to AWS. And maybe based on where you are today, you may just want to keep the database engine homogenous vis-a-vis -vis move from SQL Server on-premise to a service such as RDS SQL Server. And subsequently, in your next migration step, you may consider modernizing to an open source. We also have, as I mentioned, multiple programs that can help you accelerate this migration process. So with that, I will turn it over to Sandeep Singh to walk you through the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Manish. Hi, folks. I'm going to first talk about cost optimization and then migration best practices. In continuation with, must, with what Manish was talking about on cost optimization, right-sizing your RDS instance is a key mechanism for optimizing AWS cost. It is often ignored by organizations when they are new to the cloud. Okay. One of the advantages of deploying on AWS is that you pay for what you use. So you don't have to worry about over provisioning or under provisioning. You can always set up auto scaling for the storage, add compute and memory when needed. In case of RDS SQL Server instances, I highly recommend reviewing your hardware needs so that you don't provision more resources than you need. We should select the optimal RDS instance types based on factors like how many vCPUs we need, how much memory and storage the database needs. Based on your current deployment and usage, you may want to choose general purpose or provisioned IOPS. General purpose storage, as the name suggests, is good for regular database load. And provisioned IOPS storage is needed if you have a highly transactional large database. Similarly, the needs for tempdb, whether you need a faster separate storage or not. So we need to analyze all these factors in current deployment to do the capacity planning for RDS. One of the tips I can provide here is to choose provisioned IOPS SSD drives. You, sh uh, you should choose this if you have a highly transactional large database. Let's talk about the cost drivers. What drives your cost and how we can control it? This is similar to right sizing, but in terms of features instead of hardware. The first one is the one I have seen often being ignored. It is choosing the right edition of SQL Server. Please check if you really need an enterprise edition feature. If not, you can greatly reduce the license cost by using standard edition. RDS instances come with license included, so cost varies depending on the edition of SQL Server that you choose. The second cost driver is choosing single AZ versus multi-AZ. AZ stands for availability zones. Multi-AZ deployment is needed for high availability requirements. For non-prod deployments and non-critical applications, you may want to stay with a single AZ. Similarly, based on your DR needs, if you have a mission-critical database, you may want to take advantage of cross-region automated backups. Otherwise, backups to S3 should be fine. 
talking about read replicas, they are really useful in RDS if you have a requirement for running a lot of reports or read queries. A read replica instance costs almost as much as primary instance. So I would say create them only if you need them. One of the tips I have for new AWS customers here is to choose reserved instances instead of on demand instances. If you want to keep the instance, for at least one year. Reserved instances cost much less than on-demand instances. Let's talk about the next best practice on reducing your cost, which is database consolidation. Consolidation is the process of grouping similar workloads or databases together on a single RDS instance. I can give you three reasons why database consolidation is important. One, for reducing cost by reducing licensing, hardware, and maintenance cost. Number two, by reducing management overhead. Database servers require countless man hours to manage. Reducing instance footprint promotes efficiency. One could start by consolidating the non prod environment first. And third, for standards and centralization. With a smaller footprint, database teams tend to have a better control over standard configurations, processes, and auditing. It is a good idea to use a large instance that can host several databases than to have several instances dedicated for databases or applications. In order to achieve optimal DB consolidation, we start with Grouping similar workloads together, they can be similar in having uh, same maintenance windows or HADR needs. And then by leveraging memory optimized instances, there are instances that are purpose built for databases that need more memory. We group together databases on a memory optimized instance. While grouping them together, we should take into account the compute needs of each of those databases and ensure that the combined CPU utilization of all databases on the target instance is not more than 65 to 70 percent. We should follow the consolidation rationals and strategies to group the databases together. Let me show you an example of database consolidation in the next slide to understand the benefits of DB consolidation. This is an example of how consolidation, how consolidating the servers and databases is going to reduce the cost and overall hardware footprint. The table on the left shows an on-prem installation of 15 SQL Server instances, the allocated resources on each servers, and the utilization of those resources. As you can see, on most of the servers, the CPUs, memory, or the storage are not fully utilized. In addition to that, there is an administration overhead of 15 SQL Server instances. On moving to RDS instances, when we group the databases together on large RDS instances, now we do not need as many CPUs and memory as we needed in the previous setup, and thus reducing the cost. We were able to cut down the number of CPUs by 45%, and reduce the total number of workload by 73%. Now that we know about consolidation, let's learn about how to migrate our databases to cloud. There are various ways of migrating the databases from on-prem to AWS RDS, but the two most commonly used migration tools by customers are SQL native technologies and AWS or third party tools. As many factors going to migrations, we recommend choosing the right tool based on the nature of source database and application. SQL native technologies can be used for a simple backup and restore or uh, for as complex as distributed always on availability groups. The advantages of using SQL native tool is that SQL DBAs and developers are already familiar with the technologies. So there's minimal learning curve. In addition, 
there is no additional tooling cost. For simple databases that can withstand some downtime, backup and restore is an easy migration to RDS. For highly transactional databases, I would recommend setting up log shipping or mirroring or always on from on-prem to RDS instance. The AWS Data Migration Service or DMS is a highly effective uh, tool at migrating data from on-prem to cloud. It can be used to do full load or just the delta of the changes. It works on change data capture feature of SQL Server to copy the changes. There are also some third party tools available on AWS Marketplace that makes migration easier, such as Click or NetApp. There are cases where you may want to go with a combination of SQL native tools and AWS or third party tools. Such scenarios can be when there are network challenges or configuration challenges in setting up log shipping or always on. For the workloads that are in several terabytes and have dependencies on the OS or third party tools, you may want to choose a phased approach of two hop migration. Two hop migrations are first a left hand shift to an EC2 and then migration to RDS. It helps with workloads that have dependencies on external systems and that need some modifications before they can be migrated to RDS. Let's talk about the best practices on migrating this source database to the RDS. It is recommended to use compressed backups whenever possible, as it reduces the time to copy the backups. Another best practice is to script out the migration steps. It will be easier and faster to automate running the scripts compared to using the UI. It can also be used for your future migrations. I have seen customers concerned about data security on the cloud, and they often want to make use of the encryption features available on AWS or with SQL Server. It is advisable to configure and test your application for SSL or, or other encryption requirements before using encryption on RDS database. We have seen that most of the databases and applications usually do not work in isolation and have dependencies on external systems such as ETLs, reporting systems, or import expert jobs. It is always a good idea to check for the compatibility of these external systems and then migrate and migrate them before you migrate the SQL database. Now that we have the source database ready for migration, let's learn about preparing the target RDS instance for the restore. First, the database restore can be a high resource consuming activity. Three strategies we recommend during the restore phase are one, use a bigger instance, two, use a single AZ instead of multi AZ, and three, for large databases that are highly transactional, it may be challenging in copying the transaction log over regular internet. So use Direct Connect to copy them faster. And second, ensure the logins, SQL jobs, SSIS, and other external components are already migrated to AWS prior to migrating your database. Last one. I have a tip for the customers new to database migration is that you always update your stats after migrating the data. If not, you may see a dip in performance. Now I'm going to show you some of the best practices in setting up your target RDS instance for making your database restore faster. Okay, this is my AWS console screen. I'll go to RDS and I'll create an instance of RDS SQL Server. Okay, let's hit create database. Uh, 
Um, I'll choose standard create so that I can show you some of the options. Let's choose Microsoft SQL Server, Amazon RDS. Let's choose SQL Server Standard Edition. The version is 2019. I'll choose the production template. And um, let's not worry about database identifier, user ID or password at this time. I want to talk about instance configuration. So RDS instances are mainly categorized into three types, standard classes, memory optimized classes, and burst table classes. For a regular workload, standard classes will do just fine. But if you want to expedite your restore process, or you want to make your restore faster, you should choose memory optimized classes. And then when you're done with restore process, you should switch back to standard classes. Memory optimized classes is going to make your restore faster. Now talking about storage, we get the option to choose from general purpose SSD storage or provisioned IOPS. Magnetic IOPS, magnetic storage is really slow, so let's not talk about it, it's not recommended. The general purpose storage works just fine for a regular workload, which is not really large, and the IOPS needs are, are not very high. For a general purpose storage, you need to specify the allocated storage. It can be anything less than the maximum storage threshold specified here. So let's say it's 500. Now, about storage auto scaling, I would recommend choosing auto scaling every time you're doing a restore. Auto scaling helps you add storage to your um, allocated storage automatically. So it's always helpful to have auto scaling enabled on your instances. The other type of storage we can choose is provisioned IOPS. Now provisioned IOPS are special type of storage that can provide us predictable IOPS. If you need more than 16,000 IOPS, then it's really useful. Otherwise, general purpose SSD storage is good enough. The next setting is availability and durability. So during restore process or restore phase, we do not need a multi-AC setup because our focus is restoring a database as soon as possible. So we want to utilize the resources to the max. So it's better to use a single AC than a multi-AC. Now the next thing I want to talk about is the maintenance window. You can find it in additional configuration section. So if you scroll down right at the bottom, you'll see maintenance. So if you have a large database where the restore is going to happen over a few days, then you should choose a maintenance window such that the maintenance window does not interferes with your database restore process. We do not want any interruptions during the restore process. We do not want a server reboot or something. So choose a maintenance window, which is not interfering with your database restore. All right. So in the next slide, here are some important links about SQL Server, its pricing, its user drive, and about best practices for running RDS SQL and best practices on storage in production. If you want, you may just scan the QR code and you'll get the uh, all these links on your phone. Now call to action. Now that you understand what an RDS instance is, how to migrate, it will be a good idea to reach out to your account team to conduct a workshop, including a deep dive into migration best practices and any workload license assessments 
and I would also recommend doing a proof of concept to validate your use cases. And then you should identify any workloads that may be a good fit for RDS SQL Server. If not, then RDS Custom SQL Server. And then you can get started with a free tier where you don't have to pay if you want to just play around with the services in AWS. That's all from our side. Please go ahead and uh, ask any questions that you may have.